Hi, this is Julie Kerwin. I am the creator of I Am Elemental, the first female action figure specifically designed for girls, but loved by everyone. But that is not why I'm here today. I am here to talk about some other new exciting toys that have uh, come onto the horizon in the last few years. And uh, we're going to see what uh, the stories are behind these magnificent companies. Uh, play is powerful. The toys that children play with impact the stories they tell, shape their self-perception, and also the way that they see the world around them. In our own unique way, each one of us is working to change traditional narratives around play and around um, the industry, the toy industry as well. So I'm going to allow each one of you to introduce yourselves. I want you to share uh, the concept. I want you to talk about why you're committed to this idea of creating a new generation of toys and changing play patterns. Eleanor, take it away. Thanks, Julie. It's great to be here with you, ladies. Um, I'm, I'm Eleanor, founder of Julie Bing, a new doll and toy company that celebrates Asian American cultures. Um, so I am here in San Francisco. I am the proud mom to two young children, my son, James, and my daughter, Jillian, um, whom the company is named after. So her nickname is Jilly. Bing means cookie in Chinese, and it's one of her first words. And so that's how we came up with Jilly Bing. I think my children actually think we have a third sibling named Jilly Bing on its way because we talk about Jilly Bing coming soon. Um, so I, I'm really excited to be here. The company started last year. Um, my daughter was a little over two years old and she wanted a doll. So I figured I would go and buy a doll that looked like her. And what I found out there was just, there was a lack. I didn't think any of the dolls out there looked like an Asian American child that I know. I don't think it didn't look features wise. Um, it just didn't feel authentic to, you know, the Asian American children I know to my daughter. Um, and it, it, you know, Julie, it brought back memories of growing up, right? I remember my first doll, Ada, she was beautiful. She had long blonde curly hair, blue eyes, and, and I loved her. And I think even at that point, you know, I think I was around five or six years old. I think there was always a desire to look like Ada. My mom, you know, tells a story of me taking scissors and one day just like cutting off all of Ada's hair. And suddenly she has short hair to look like me, because that's what most Asian girls had at that point in the 80s, right? These sort of short bob haircuts that you know, I think most of them were done by mom in the bathroom. Um, and I cut her hair. And I even my mom said I threw her in the washing machine. One day, like unbeknownst to my mom, when my mom was doing laundry, I threw that doll in with, with the rest of whatever was going on. Um, and, you know, I think when I look back at that experience, I think even at that young age, subconsciously, I wanted my doll, I wanted to look like my doll. She was my definition of beautiful, but I knew, you know, inherently I would, I didn't have blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, and I think, you know, there was just this feeling of, I was the other, right? I didn't quite belong. I wasn't as beautiful as her. And, you know, we can sort of tell the story today and sort of be able to laugh a bit about it and reflect on it. But really as a mom, um, I wanted something different for my daughter and children like her. I, I wanted a different course. Um, and, you know, as we'll talk about later, you know, I, I didn't come from the toy industry. I had a full-time day job in healthcare business development, but I just, I just knew the more I looked and upon, during that search of looking into dolls, I came upon Zoe. And I remember looking at the Zoe doll and just saying, oh my gosh, she is beautiful. And Yalissa, I don't know if you know this, but I've been idolizing and stalking you since then. I just, you know, my mind, I wanted to do for the Asian American community what Yalitza had done um, in her community with the Zoe doll, what she had done um, to really push representation. So, so here we are um, a little over a year later. Uh, we are just a few short weeks away from having our first uh, thousand plus Jilly Bing dolls shipping out to customers around the country with a stopover in my, in my garage. Exactly. Um, that it's fascinating. And I, you know, I also, and we're going to get to production later, but you your, your sculpt is beautiful. I will say it real. I can see why Eleanor, you fell in love with it. Talk about healthy roots. And I also want to note before we go in a little dive, a little deeper is that while Eleanor and I are both kind of moms who needed to kind of 
see a hole in the market to fill it. Your story is completely different, and I find it really fascinating. Uh, as someone who celebrates creativity as a superpower, um, uh, please share with us your origin story. I sound like a superhero. Um, you are a superhero. <laughs> my origin story is that I am an artist um, that cares a lot about social issues. So I've always been a very right is right and wrong is wrong kid growing up. Um, I would make my mom give people money or like help people when she probably didn't really want to help them <laughs> um, just because I was like we have to and so as an adult and as a teenager that grew into being aware of some of the social issues that plagued our society so um, sexism racism all the isms and bringing that into my artwork when I applied to the Rhode Island School of Design um, being very involved in the activism in my community and on my and trying to bring that to my campus because as artists and designers, I recognize we create the content that consumers consume. And so it is our responsibility to be socially aware um, and advocate on the behalf of others and educate. And so I was trying to figure out like, okay, how do I do that? And then also like somehow bring this into my degree, which I'm paying $60,000 a year for. How do I do both at the same time? And I had this one class project where we had to redesign fairy tale characters for modern storytelling. And I decided to take Rapunzel, which is a traditional, like she's, you know, she's white with blonde hair and she's very beautiful. But what if I directly juxtapose that against an image that I wasn't told often was beautiful, which is a like a chocolate dark skin baby doll um, with long kinky hair and this is a beautiful princess too and when I presented that as a, in my class a lot of people said wow this looks a lot like a doll have you thought about taking this further and I was like I came to art school to make art not toys um, but you know I'll talk to people and that's when I did my first bit of research with consumers and I didn't realize I was defining a problem in an audience. When I went online in a Facebook, in my Facebook community and hundreds of comments later realized none of us had dolls that looked like us growing up or none of us really knew how to do our hair. Or what if we had dolls that looked like us with our hair and we could learn how to play with it. And that's ultimately how I decided I wanted to do more than just paint a doll brown, but create a product that's designed to show girls how to actually love their curls and take care of it, which is how we got to Healthy Roots Dolls and our first dolls Zoe, um, and now the rest of her crow friends. Fabulous. It really is an interesting thing. I, you know, I call it testing the hypothesis. You know, we did that on kick, via Kickstarter. You did it clearly via RISD. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing, I think, when you have this moment of understanding that there is a hole to be filled and that you have figured out, um, even serendipitously, how to fill it. So, very, very, very fun story. Um, to that end, as toy insiders, you know, the learning curve can be really steep. And we used to joke at the beginning, I kept saying, we're getting dressed in the dark every day, right? Because we really didn't know what we were doing. Um, you know, in some respects, we were making it up as we went along. Um, I always say the internet's like a genie in a bottle. I would, you know, we, were, we had this access to information that I didn't, that maybe if we'd had these ideas 10 years ago, we couldn't have pursued. But, um, you know, basically what I want to hear from each one of you now is a little bit about that journey of creation. Um, you know, what difficulties did you face during the design? Neither one of you come from uh, the toy industry in a design background, you know, this kind of strict toy making background. How did you overcome those difficulties? Um, and then I want to hear a little bit about your production journey too, um, because I think that uh, for people in the industry, they are curious to know how outsiders navigate it. And for people with an idea, they'd want to know how to navigate it. So Eleanor, why don't you share a little bit with us? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to. I distinctly remember it was around March of 2022 when my daughter wanted the doll. Um, I started looking and then decided I'm going to, I'm going to do something about it. I distinctly remember Googling, how do you make a doll? And watching like loads of YouTube videos, like of, like doll heads being stamped and hairs being rooted. So it was completely, and I, I don't have a creative background as well. So um, where we are Jilly Bing today, um, we have a team of all Asian American parents who come with deep experiences in toy industry, product design, um, 
we didn't start there, right? The, the journey to bring this group together was, it was a journey. And I think there was two distinct phases. The first was, I had a very clear notion of what I thought an authentic Asian American doll should look like. I had a very clear vision in my head of what she should kind of look like and feel like. And I remember those first few months of just, it was like a hole in my wallet that kept, because I kept I worked with certain, some toy designers um, and I said, hey, I want a, a doll that looks like this. And the designs I got were just, they were really disappointing, right? Somehow it just, these dolls just didn't look Asian or they looked cartoony, overly cartoony, overly stereotypical. And it was really, really kind of like, it was painful. Um, and I just really, I remember feeling really disappointed and frustrated, right? Of like, here's the vision and here's the money I'm spending, the time I'm spending and the designs were just not coming up anywhere close. Um, things took a turn, I think, really kind of a few months down the road when I connected with this incredible um, family of Asian American toy designers based in LA. So Lisa, um, who is a product and toy designer, her father, Dave Okada, is actually a, a, an industry legend. He is credited with creating the Star Wars figurine dolls for Kenner back in the 80s. So wow. he's a VP of Kenner, Japanese American, um, you know, kind of, you know, sort of, sort of really kind of breaking the mold of, you know, what's possible back then and bringing their family on to help us think about how do we really design a product with the customer in mind, with really kind of changing how things are done. And I remember we had like rows and rows of like, Asian American eyes, nose, mouths, like all these different children. It was kind of scary at some point in my house, which was like all these pictures of like Asian American children and really trying to bring out the essence of what we were trying to capture. Um, and in the end, you know, interestingly enough, the person who actually is credited, whom I would give credit to design the doll's face um, is someone from outside of the industry. He is an Asian American um, father who is in the game designing world. So it was just... You know, in many ways, it was a lot of trial and error things we didn't know, you know, lots of mistakes, lots of learnings, um, but we never sort of lost track of like, what is that vision of what we think a doll should look like? Um, and through that, we kind of pieced together, you know, people who I never known, people I didn't think would be part of the design journey. And so that's that's how what led us to our first doll, Jilly Bing. Um, and on the other side, on the production side, you know, it was, we gave the production house, finding a production house is part of the journey. Then we gave them a 3D print, beautifully painted with all the, you know, all the fashion, all the colors. And I said, replicate this. How hard can it be? We want this exactly. What I didn't know, Julie, is that there are 50 different shades of what you classify as Asian black hair. Do you want nylon? Do you want fiber? Do you want this black and that black under the sun? Um, and, you know, we just, we spent more time and money um, to get it right. You know, we didn't want an off-the-shelf doll mold. We wanted a 14-inch, which required special tooling. Um, but we just really invested the, the time and the energy. It took us longer. It was probably more painful, but really kind of, really kind of keeping very close to the vision of what we had. You know, it's funny. I, I as hard as it is, you know, I... I can see your smile. I can see your excitement as you're telling the story. And this is one of the reasons that I really wanted to participate in this panel discussion, you know, because when we launched on Kickstarter, it was nine years ago and uh, nine long years with the pandemic in there as well. And so the enthusiasm and the excitement of those early days, um, really hearing you talk gets me excited again about it reinvigorates even me in terms of what I'm doing. And I love it because so much resonates and so much is just, this is how it does happen. And I love that you went to the experts, but your experts were a little bit outside the box. And that's how you were able to get a product put together that didn't exist within the industry. And I find that that's kind of the nuance of, in, in my experience, what has to happen. Now, I want to hear, Elisa, is this the same, is this what you, like, did you go in the perimeters of the industry or did you dive right in and find someone from within the toy industry to help you create that beautiful mold? One of my strengths is the fact that I come from a creative background. So fortunately for me, I was able to start visualizing on pen and paper with pen and paper what I wanted my products to look like and figure out the brand and things like that. And not everyone is going to have that ability, but everyone has the ability to identify what they don't know 
and then what they need to know in order to make something happen and talk to people um, and go online and look into you know the process like you talked about seeing the different molds being produced and things like that so for me once I figured out okay I do understand how to visually design what I want something to look like but I actually don't know anything about the production process or finding a manufacturer or how do you select the different materials and fibers or the packaging or how do you even like insurance all these different pieces and parts to the process that you might not even figure out as an outsider until you get into it. So I decided to build a roadmap for myself of like how to go from sketch to physical product and where I could connect with people. So I think it's important when you're beginning to look at your network and the opportunities around you to see where you could potentially access knowledge. So you might have a local college where they have a design program where a professor might have come from um, an adjacent industry, whether it's like you said, a video game designer who knows how to do 3D renderings or previously worked at Hasbro or Mattel and ask them and ask them to connect with them and ask them questions. And that's what I did. So I was connecting with professors. And then fortunately my institution also helped students go to Toy Fair. So I was able to go to Toy Fair um, and connect with people there and ask questions as a student um, and build relationships within the industry. Uh, from there, I was able to go online and find people who knew how to uh, take sketches into and turn them into 3D renderings. And then from there, um, through my network, I was able to connect with people who had worked on different types of manufacturing, who, whether it was like automobiles or robotics, who could ask their network around for potential manufacturing contacts. I didn't actually get to my current manufacturer until I was connected through some entrepreneurship programs that I participated in, which is another big thing, is there are tons of opportunities out there to apply for funding, to apply for programs where they will mentor and guide you and provide you with resources to further your ideas, whether it's a toy product or a tech product. Um, and so that's something I dove myself into. I decided to find people within the toy industry I could learn from, whether it was at organizations like the Toy Association, Women in Toys, or my personal network. And then also on the small business side of things, whether it was like startups and tech, going into those spaces and connecting with people as well. And through those programs, I was ultimately able to be connected to the people who connected me to my manufacturer. It's a very long chain, but the whole process is a journey of learning. Um, and you have to build a roadmap for yourself of what do I need to figure out and how do I get to the people that can help me do those things? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting that you you, you talk of a roadmap, I you know, because that's, you know, it's it's really, it's very smart, but it's really the antithesis of my getting dressed in the dark every day analogy. The thing where we overlap is the, you know, I do think um, my partner Vanita always says that the reason we're still in business is because we know what we don't know and we're not afraid to say it. And so, you know, we're always actively looking for people. And to your point, um, you know, that first year at Toy Fair, I made friends and mentors who are still helping me to this day. And so the network, and especially, you're right, women in toys as well. So there are resources out there, um, but Google is your friend. Um, Eleanor saw that, you know, Googling. And uh, and it is amazing, I think, to see, to your point, the, uh, the network that can be created. I also think it's really interesting that you were able to use these entrepreneurship programs um, because that is something that most definitely did not exist when I was in college. Um, you know, this is something that I've seen. Uh, my son, I think, is probably around your age. And so, uh, you know, I got to go to a big event at one point while he was in college celebrating this massive creation of an entrepreneurship program at his university. So, you know, there, these are the shifts and changes that I think have made um, access easier. For us, we used Kickstarter, right? We used crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, literally from the day I had the idea, crowdfunding was the way that I was going to do this. You use these, these you know, grants and entrepreneurship programs. And Eleanor, just very quickly, out of curiosity, what, where did your factory come from? Um, it came from, <laughs> I, I, I went through some bill of lading. Somehow I could find bill of ladings online, um, look wow. at certain dolls and just trace them back. And I reached out to 10, only one responded. Um, and interestingly enough, I think Alyssa and I talked about this. Um, my 
uncle runs a factory in a completely different industry in China. And he kept telling me there's a toy factory next door to us. And I said, no, no, I don't want any toy factory. Like, I think you're not, you don't understand what I'm trying to create. Long story short, it converges between my deep dive searching, one company that responds to me, the factory we end up using is the same one that is next door to my uncle's factory. That's amazing. That's hysterical. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So let's take, let's shift gears a little bit. Okay. So we, we, we've talked about cons, the, the, the dream that becomes reality. We talked about production, how we bring it to life. Let's talk about the customer experience a little bit, you know, um, because what you're trying to do is change the conversation because what you're trying to do is put something out into the universe that didn't ever exist before. Um, I imagine that the response was, you know, kind of gratifying. I, you know, I say even nine years later today, you know, uh, the personal stories that we hear from our customers is what sustains us. It keeps us going. It's it's just as important and and uh, kind of meaningful to us today as it was then. So can you talk to me a little bit, Eleanor, about that experience and what it's meant to you in terms of, you know, the difference between having an idea in your house and having all these things, you know, the hair and the eyes versus sending it out into the universe and seeing how everyone responds to it. Yeah. Um, you know, when we first started this journey, when I started to look for this doll, I would ask other um, Asian American parents and sort of conversation, everyone would say, no, can't find one, didn't have one. Remember the one, you know, remember the blonde hair, remember the tropical doll that your mom said was the closest one to looking Asian. So there was all this Conversation. So there's just always a conviction, right? Both from, from my own experiences as well as talking to, you know, all the moms and friends in our in our lives. But when we this past December, right, you know, right at the middle of the holidays, what was meant to be a sharing amongst close friends and family, letting our close friends and family know, hey, we're launching this, please support us. It was our version of a, a private Kickstarter, um, became this this post or that became this conversation that was, you know. Um, you know, we would, you know, people would share what I had told them on, you know, an email and that became these social media posts that really just generated thousands of really, really heartwarming responses from people I, I didn't know, people I never met. Um, they were Asian Americans, they were non-Asians, right? They were CEOs, they were celebrities, they were mayors of cities that really just came out of the woodwork. And it was really, the headline was finally, finally, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I never had this doll. I always wanted this doll. I'm a grandparent and I still can't find this doll. Um, some of the commentaries that really just, you know, as you said, kind of fueled me that keeps me going is, you know, someone had said, you know, even in play, Asian Americans have had to imagine themselves as someone else. Asian American mm -hmm. girls have had to imagine themselves as someone else. And that, you know, you know, things like that, that, you know, it's more than about a doll. It's about being seen. Um, and I think really that has really kept us going, really kept giving us our true north of like, we need to address this, right? Everyone across generations, right? You have people who are in their 60s and 70s, you have younger girls. One girl's like, I'm not even pregnant yet, but this is for my future daughter. Oh, that's great. So that's been really the, 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 the piece that keeps our team going. Um, and I think the other part was, you know, when we first launched this, we were targeting Asian American parents, or that's who we assumed were our early adopters. And as we were getting pre-orders, it was interesting. We had orders from like Chattanooga and Des Moines. And I was always just curious. I was like, are they Asians? Are they, you know, and I would reach out to some of these folks and, you know, people would respond, say, some would say, you know, I don't have an Asian child, uh, but I think my children should have dolls that look like the rest of the country or that look like their friends. And so that has been, you know, really just, it's been great to see. And we're, we're really excited to get these, these dolls out to all the families out there. I think that's actually one of the really fascinating things about this is that you think that you're filling a hole in the market and then you discover that the market's much bigger than you originally intended. For us, it was adult male collectors. We, you know, we ended up having this unexpected response from adult male collectors who would write us and say, um, you know, I'm a 25 year old man and I bought your action figure because I liked the paint out and the articulation, but I read the materials that came with it and every girl should have this action figure. And and uh, so I think that's a really great reflection on what you're doing and that you're doing something that uh, has, you know, meaning beyond your even initial intent is, to your point, just a signifier that you're doing something that needed to be done. 
Yeah, what just about- side side story there. It was, you know, as I was searching back when I was searching for Adolfo Jillian, one day my mom, whom I love dearly, but is of a different generation, she comes home with this blonde hair, blue eyed doll, you know, like a new variation of Ada for yes. my daughter. And I'm like, mom, what, 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 what is that? She's like, that was the most beautiful doll in the toy store. <laughs> right now we all, wow. hey, Alyssa, you'll appreciate this. My husband and I, we go to Target and we ordered ourselves a Healthy Roots dolls. And we're like, you know what? We're going to diversify the collection we have at home. Until Jilly Bing comes to life, we're going to make sure our daughter knows beautiful is not limited to this. Wow. Amazing. Lisa, what about you? Tell us a little bit. About uh, reactions? Yes. Just give us a little a little snippet of reaction. Um. Yeah. So I started... Uh, in 2014 and then we launched a Kickstarter in 2015 and we saw a lot of organic conversations happening um, because at that time there weren't a lot of toys of different skin tones facial features hair textures and we were really focused on the hair play Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of conversations in the community about natural hair and the fact that there's still a lot of discrimination when it comes to uh, black women's hair in the workplace um, also black men Um, a lot of bias with people and how they're allowed to wear their hair. And then when we finally launched our product a few years later and we got to see it trickle out and seeing the the immediate response from children being, oh my gosh, she looks just like me. Oh my God, her hair is just like mine. And then getting to see now that people are more aware of the product and understand how to use it, seeing like matching hairstyles, matching outfits, um, seeing lots of conversations like this child will not leave this doll at home. Um, and then also seeing like women who are not children, like so they're not kids, they're 30, 40, 50 years old and their partners or their friends or they themselves are buying these dolls because I never had this growing up and she's beautiful. Um, those are some of the, the reactions that we've seen. And I think it's really beautiful. Can I uh, circle back really quickly, if you don't mind, uh, could you talk about the hair a little bit? Because I find it, uh, you know, your product is amazing, but your the hair on the doll is, you know, tangibly different from what you see on other dolls. I'm assuming it's some sort of secret proprietary, you know, top secret information. But if you ask asking Black women about their hair, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. You know, how did you evolve to the the end result? And, you know, like you said, OK, I'm an artist. I was able to design what I wanted, but designing it and producing it are two different things. So if you don't mind just circling back very briefly, uh, because I am I because I love it so much. If you could just quickly give us a little snapshot of how you got to that point. I, so I think it's it's less about hair and more about a work process. Um, and for me, when I was growing up, and this is something I think that's important for people to practice, my parents would very much instill to me, like, you have to take pride in everything that you produce, everything that you do. Um, and so if you're going to do something right, you got to do it right the first time, because if you have to repeat it over and over again, you're just wasting your own time, you're wasting resources, you're wasting funds, it's just not effective. Um, and it's disrespectful to yourself and your work ethic. So when it came to the product and me as an art student and everything I do in life, um, I spend a lot of time planning. Like my art was 80% figuring out what I was going to do on the canvas and then 20% doing it. Um, so there's a lot of planning, a lot of research. And so when it came to the dolls, that's how I approached it. Um, I knew that the industry wasn't doing this for a reason, whether it was they didn't think they would sell or they didn't understand it, but I understood it. And so with my knowledge of hair care and, you know, understanding how exactly natural hair works and the different fibers that exist and like how it needs to respond to product, a good couple months of my product development years was spent actually watching like hair react to products and like getting on calls and like making people listen to me and not accepting anything that wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. And I tell people this a lot. It's like, if you don't like your prototype, don't approve it. Right. Do not approve your prototype until they get it exactly right. Whether it's the shade, the place of placement of the eyelashes, the shape of the lips, the all of those things. If it's not right and it's not what you want, you're not paying for that. And so that's how I approach the hair. It's like, unless you fully understand what we're doing, I'm going to go somewhere else and find people that can do it. And this is how, and it needs to be like this 99.99% of the time so that everyone has that experience with the product. 
Yeah, I think that that's very good advice. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I I will say that to your point, when you go in to actually work with the people in the industry who have to produce what you're trying to create, there can sometimes be a disconnect between what you uh, intend, what you want, and what uh, what they just are so used to doing, um, that there does have to be a, a, a bit of a language or a vocabulary change. In our case, it was the bum. Every, but they couldn't get rid of the crack on the bum. It was like, what are you talking about? The bum does not have to have a crack. And we did, you know, we made it a joke. We called it, we said, bridge the gap, bridge the gap. And that was a way that we worked around in the industry, getting them to understand exactly what it was that we needed to be done. But there are some disconnects. Thank I you. So just, can I just jump and say how grateful I am to hear, have this conversation because my dolls were supposed to arrive in May, um, but due to my obsessiveness, with the way the mouth was tilted and the eyes. So for me, our version of the hair is, you know, and I look at Asian Americans, sort of the stereotype that we want the stereotypes we want to break down is she's not demure, she's not dainty. So we spent so much time trying to create energetic smile to her, an energetic pose. And somehow that got lost. Somewhere in the production, the, design, the production process, it got lost and the mouth just didn't have a smile. And I remember just obsessing over the angling of that smile. And the factor was like, that's going to cost you a few weeks. And you're like, well, I can see it, you know, and you know, I would show people these, these smiles. And so some people it's like, well, they all look close enough. But I think what we all share here is just this conviction, right? Like, and I think that's what you said is, is right. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it well, right? Even if it requires those extra call, phone calls, those slight delays, extra costs, but that detail that you can see, right? I, I feel like we couldn't live with that. I couldn't live with their smile just being angled down just slightly. Exactly. That, that, you know, totally agree. Um, I want to circle back now. We're going to circle back a lot, but uh, I want to talk a bit, little bit about social media and about spreading the word. So um, maybe I should have, you know, kind of folded that more into a community because obviously how do you get people to respond to you um, in 2023, that's social media. And the truth is, is, you know, I joke that I have to admit that I was a complete Luddite when I got involved in this. I personally was not on social media at all. I didn't know really the difference between Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, and I also naively thought that I was selling a toy. So why would I need to be on social media? Because I was morally opposed to children being on social media. Um, but obviously I had to be educated about what we do and part of marketing in uh, the, this era is social media. So could Eleanor, could you talk a little bit about, you know, how have you been spreading the word? Do you find one form of social media kind of more useful than another? Um, tell me, tell me your story. Yeah, I don't, I can't say I've cracked it. I think similar to you, Julie, I, prior to Jelly Bing, I was only on Facebook. Um, I was very against having my children's faces and my faces out there. Fast forward a year later, like my daughter's face is everywhere. Um, so it's been a learning curve. Um, I think we can all sort of attest to the importance of social media, right? Sort of the organic sharing, especially when you're a small company, you don't have, you know, multi-million dollar budgets. No one knows your brand. You're trying to get your story out there. Um, so, you know, I saw that potential, right? I kind of experienced it when we launched and people were sharing and it was just like this excitement, right? Um, so I think it is important. It has helped our company launch. Um, we're excited about the next phase when people receive the dolls, right? I'm excited to hear those stories of like my doll, you know, my daughter were inseparable, right? Where we're looking forward to that content. Um, but I think it's really, when I look at, you know, what Alyssa was saying, or Julie, you don't, you know what you don't know, right? So I think we have created this beautiful Jilly being our first product. The next phase is really finding the right, you know, kind of the right, cadence for us to, you know, market and get this word out on social media. So we're still learning is where we are right now. Yalitza, you want to, you want to advise on social media uh, marketing here? Um, so I kind of grew up on the internet and there was a moment in time where I actually wasn't allowed to use it. So from about uh, 20, 2008 to 2012, I wasn't allowed to be online. Um, except sometimes I would watch like anime and like do my college applications. And then in my undergrad at college, I discovered like Tumblr. 
and that and Facebook. So that was like my first foyer into exploring social. And because of my passion for social issues, I had a lot of conversations on Facebook on my campus, organizing, um, making memes, leading conversations, like being like a source of like what's the current hot topic or what are what political ideology or 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 whose uh, performance are we dissecting today? And so you learn a lot about how conversation happens online and how audiences are built. And that's what helped propel um, the beginning of Healthy Results for me um, with our Kickstarter campaign, which was shared organically on Facebook and then Tumblr. And then I, I finally dipped my toes into at a later date on Twitter. So we primarily used Facebook, Instagram, and then later Twitter for my own personal voice. And most recently um, using LinkedIn. And the, my approach to social media is, um, it's always about storytelling first. And you have to recognize what would be valuable or what would be interesting to your audience on your different platforms, but also true and authentic to yourself. And so that's one of the things that I stay true to, um, even till now, even though I don't post as actively as myself, is what are my what are my buckets? What are the things that I care about? What are the things that I want to post? Because if social media is not fun for you, it's just not going to be fun. Um, <laughs> and so for myself, I would always talk about like, you know, most recently, like The Little Mermaid. That's something I love to share because it aligns with my values and it's something that's engaging for everyone. Um, and I think that what's really important is you have to, I actually saw a tweet today where it was like, being a social media manager means being chronically online. And it's true. Um, Twitter has been really great for learning how to write copy because you only have so many characters and it's what people are talking about now. Nobody cares about what you want to talk about. What are we all talking about collectively as a group in these in these different echo chambers? And then um, when it comes to marketing, I'm trying to find the best way to describe it, but you can't, what I've learned throughout marketing from my brand, because I, I built all of our pages, all of our audiences, um, having us go viral organically on different platforms, is that you need to constantly be iterating and changing things. Nobody wants to look at graphics with words on them on the internet anymore, unless it's a really funny tweet. And it's like, you have to just keep moving. So it's like a lot of people resisted IG reels, but that's what people are making. Now. A lot of people resisted being on TikTok, but that's what people are making now. So it's like, you have to be fluid and moving and following the content creation and experimenting. If something doesn't work, if you're not seeing engagement or if, you see, if you're not seeing people want to, you know, you're not, your accounts aren't growing, you're, you're, you're not finding new audiences, you have to change. You have to change and you have to keep changing until you find something that works. Because it's very easy to just be like a hamster on a wheel and be like, well, we're posting photos and our dolls are cute and like our products are this, but it's like, is it working? No, then do something that is working. So that's been my approach to marketing um, is always iterating, always trying new things. Um, I myself didn't want to be on TikTok. And then as soon as we did, we grew our accounts very quickly um, and were able to find uh, opportunities to grow the brand with media features and things like that. So yeah, I'm not sure how succinct that is, but if anyone takes anything from it, it's to experiment on social um, and to find inspiration from other people that are winning. Well, no, I think that's I think that that is help, helpful, and I think that it I think it's interesting, and I I do think it is sometimes hard to stay current and understand what you know kind of the trends are I will also as a small aside say do whatever you can to not get hacked um, because uh, we did have a hacking an Instagram hacking and while we were lucky enough to recover the account uh, it's never I think that it's like shadow banned because it was hacked like it's never we have not recovered um, our uh, our Instagram uh, engagement in the way that it was prior to the hacking so be careful, people, with the way in which you interact. Also, um, everyone is not your friend. Uh, and so, you know, that is one of the things that was hard for us to recognize and acknowledge because I call, I say it's like having um, pen pals all around the world now, you know, with our customers. And I'm grateful for the interactivity of social media, whereas you are clearly much better at the marketing angle. Uh, I find it kind of more friend building. Um, I, I'm not quite as adept at the market uh, market aspect. And so I have to learn from you. Speaking of which, let's talk about something else that you've done that Eleanor and I have not done. You know, from the beginning, we deliberately chose not to take any outside funding. 
And we felt that we would be pushed into this kind of hyper growth situation and that it would have been untenable for us uh, in the way that we were functioning. And I do believe that we'd probably be out of business today if we had taken the money. Um, and I could give you a list of a half a dozen friends, women entrepreneurs who are out of business, who I, you know, one time or other was very jealous about because they took the money. However, it's clearly working for you. And to your to, to, you know, you've explained like you're coming, you came at this um, from an entrepreneurial uh, kind of expectation from the beginning, and you had access to these grants and this language and this opportunity in college. So would you please share with us a little bit about fundraising and the challenges that you've had with it? Because I, I assume that it's not all perfect, um, but the, the, also the benefits. Yeah, I think, Fundraising is something um, that currently is a hot topic because over the past couple of years, the past four years, I'd say, um, people have seen a lot of news about startups and tech companies and raising millions of dollars to get their projects off the ground. And honestly, when I get asked by about fundraising by multiple founders, whether they're a physical product company, a toy company, or a tech company, um, if you are a physical goods company, that's something that is marketable, something that you can organically sell yourself. I often tell them, do you actually need to raise funding or can you, customers are, you, are going to be your best source of capital, build your product. And if you can, and if you can through fin other financing options, do that. Um, funding is definitely uh, something that I thought about for a long time and ultimately pursued because it was more about the relationships with the investors and, and shared vision and knowing that was expanding my network. And a lot of those investors were people who watched my journey and have advised and mentored me throughout the process. So it, it naturally made sense when that was what we were pursuing as our financing option. Um, but it, when I talk to people who, again, have those physical product companies, I always think it makes more sense to pursue other financing options. Um, receiving capital does can have a strain depending on the type of business that you're building, but it depends on the nature of the relationship you have with your investors, what your ultimate goals are. Um, are you trying to be the next Hasbro, Hasbro or are you trying to build a great brand, great product and sell that? Um, it's all going to depend. So I can't really give a clear answer, but I can tell people confidently that it's not your only option. You can do other things. Is there, uh, is there anything, uh, listen, that's a great advice. And I, and I 100% agree with you about the notion that the difference between kind of tangible versus tech and all of that. But I am just, and, and I understand and appreciate your point about the mentorship and that you were bringing in people who were experts who could help lift you up. Is there anything that you regret about it? Is there anything that you found, you know, kind of like that you would say, listen, just be aware. If you do this, you should expect this as well. Um, you know, I'm not trying to push you. I'm just curious because you do hear about the pressures that can uh, occur, but once you have investors who may have a different motivation, a different goal than you or anything like that. So yeah, I like I mentioned in the previous answer, it's like having the right investors is important. I have not personally experienced that. I don't know a lot of founders who have personally, but the typical phrase is not all money is good money. So you do have to be selective. Um, and when I think back on my journey, part of the reason why um, I've had a different experience when it comes to fundraising and having finding investors is because I spent several years not chasing money. I spent two years having people tell me, go, go raise capital, go raise capital, go to investors and being told no back to back to back. And you read these stories about people who are like, I got 250 no's before I got my first yes. And I was like, it sounds like you spent hours of time that could have been spent on your company chasing money that was never going to be yours in the first place. That you could have been building your product, building whatever instead. So I'm not going to do that um, because, you know, once you, once you get feedback about why people are saying, oh, we need to see an MVP or we want to see some traction or we don't understand this market, it's like, okay, I obviously have a lot of work to do before I get my first yes. So let me go and do my best to build that out so that when I come back and you tell me no again, we both know why you're saying no. That's so, excellent. 
<laughs> no, that's great. You know, it's funny. I, I, we call, I call us the unsexy startup. You know, we were never, it was never about the bells and whistles. It was never about, you know, the, how it looked to the outside. We were just trying to build the business. And so uh, everything that you say resonates and, and sounds great. Um, so, you know, thank you for that and humoring me. And now let's shift back. Let's talk a little bit about toys and about why, why you think as an outsider, you had to be the one to do this. You know, when we showed up to Toy Fair in 2015, we were really considered a novelty act. Um, we were this like rare and unusual species. They put us in the, they put us in modern design. There was no action figures availability space, and people were coming up and they would like turn their their um, passes over so we couldn't see which companies they were from because they just wanted to kind of like come and and gawk at the crazy people who thought that they were going to sell female action figures for girls. You know, a year later, every sign in the entrance was girl power. And so, you know, a lot can change um, in a year and a lot can change in a few years. And so here you are um, trying to change the conversation, trying to, to, to bring something to market that, that you saw a need for. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what more needs to change? Where do you see this going? You know, what do you expect if you, you know, if you were imagining us having this conversation in three years, five years, 10 years, you know, how fast do you think things are changing? Um, you know, what is your role in all of this? What some, you know, give me some thoughts about what it is that, motivates you, Eleanor, when you're thinking about this and how you want to change the industry and where you think it's going? Yeah, that's a, that's a yes. Um, you know, recently we got our one of our final samples um, of the Jelly Bang doll. And, you know, I relate this because this is the core. This is the heart of what we do, right? Um, my daughter, who's three and a half at this point, she looks at the doll and she touches the, the eyebrow and she's like, Momo, which means hair. And she looks, touches the doll's eyes and she's like, black. Momo, and then she touches her own eyes. She touches the doll, she touches her own eyes, and she's like, like me, like me, like me, Jilly. Um, and that is really the, that's the DNA of our company, right? That this is for my child to be able to see a doll that looks like her um, and to be able to replicate this experience, right? Into many, many more homes. So this is where we're getting started today. It's our first product. And as I look at, Asian Americans as a, as a, as a, you know, it's a monolithic term, right? The reality is there's 20 plus origin groups. You know, you think even within Asians, there's Chinese, Japanese, Koreans. But if you look at today's Asian Americans, we're a diverse group, right? We have Blasian children. We have Hapa children, half black, half Asian, half white, half Asian. There are boys, right? Um, and when I, for us, we really want to, be able to showcase the diversity of what Asian America looks like for our children. We want to normalize what it looks like, that we are not the one token doll that represents, you know, the one doll for Asian American represents all these everybody. Um, but also just to really kind of, you know, Jilly Bing is our first character. We have this vision of all these lovable Asian American characters that are you know, they bring, they teach you a bit about Asian cultures and foods, but they're just fun, lovable characters, right? Why can't they be normalized? Why do they have to be a certain way, right? Traditionally, they're the math nerd. They're the Kung Fu artist, right? They wear certain traditional costumes. We want to just start breaking all of that down, right? We just want to create this world of diverse and fun Asian American characters. Um, we're just getting started. When I think about why we do this, what we want to accomplish, at the core of it, it's having the Jilly Bing experience, what my daughter experienced for many children. Um, I would love, you know, my kids are now three and five. I would love it when they're teenagers um, and people talk about iconic Asian brands, that there is Hello Kitty, but then there's also Jilly Bing. Right. And an educational version of Hello Kitty. That's that's where our, that's why we're doing this. Um, we're starting with one doll, but the vision is to create that that modern day sort of educational version of an Asian American brand. Um, so that's that's what keeps me going late at night. That's what keeps, you know, sort of the the, the you know, changing family vacations so we can have these thousand dogs ship into our garage and fulfill it. 
you know, I think we're on a trend, right? I think we're of a generation that's very fortunate, you know, being able to Google, right? Being able to say, I love healthy roots. I'm going to Google and I'm going to find a way to connect with, with the let and learn about her journey, right? Same thing, Julie, being able to go on LinkedIn and like stalk you and find you. So I think, you know, when I look at other, on you know, what's possible, I think for all of us, we we have this opportunity, this generation, right? To, it's a little cliche, but we, we get to be sort of the change agents that we want. And I think you've seen it from each of our stories here, right? Not necessarily coming from the industry, but seeing this, this having this vision and being able to, go out and create it from scratch. So I, I'm excited about, you know, seeing many more companies like Healthy Roots and Jilly Bing and I Am Elemental. I think the more competition we have, right? The more folks trying to do what we do, it's just going to elevate the results. Absolutely. Yulitsa, what about you? You want to share a little bit about your vision and where you think it fits within the industry and the culture? I'm not sure if I can expand on it because I feel like, you know, I think about what we've accomplished so far and I'm just like, this was the vision and it's already realized. So, you know, not just with the brand, but like my own individual professional accomplishments. So the fact that we've had interns and like team members that have been able to grow with the brand and learn about marketing and um, build their resumes. And like, we've helped like young women of color in, in art and design in their early years in their undergrad get um, working experience to designing these products and actually getting them to market, getting them to retail, seeing them out and about in the wild, um, seeing people's responses to it. I I think it's fully realized. I've accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish. Um, I mean, going global would definitely be like a next big thing for us and expanding on the product experience. So we, I always said that I wanted to create dolls to represent girls from around the world. Um, it is very hard to launch a product um, especially like multiple variations. Um, but if I could do more, I'd love to do that. It's great. You know, it's funny. I used to very cheekily say people would ask me this question in interviews in the early days. And I would say, oh, well, you know, Bowerman started Nike with a waffle iron and some sneakers in the kitchen. And Bezos started Amazon with some books in his garage. And I am Elemental started with some action figures at the dining room table. But the potential is uh, endless. And I, I still do believe that. And I think that what uh, what you guys are doing is kind of a reflection of that ethos. And I like, I think that this is the perfect end to our discussion because we have both ex ends of the, you know, polar extremes, right? not extremes, but both ends of the conversation where we have Eleanor talking about this idea of this is where I'm starting, but I see this grand potential. And we see healthy roots on the other end saying, this is what I envisioned. And I brought it to life and I accomplished that. And I, and I, and I was able to bring people in so that it wasn't just my experience. And that's exactly what I was trying to do. And I think both of you are wonderful role models for not just the future toy makers of America, but the, um, you know, anyone who has an idea, who has a goal, who has a dream for uh, what they want to kind of bring to life or affect, bring into effect in the world. And I really enjoyed hearing your stories. I It, it does, even as someone who's further along than both of you, it inspires inspires me, motivates me. And uh, I can only imagine what it will do for people who are just starting out. So I want to thank you both for sharing your stories with me, for letting me uh, harangue you with questions, but I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And uh, I look forward to seeing where both of you uh, continue on your journey. So thank you so much. Thanks, Julie.